بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا عقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا اللهم أعنا على ذكرك وشكرك وحسن عبادتك يا رب العالمين in this series of Al Adab Al Mufrad, it is the first introduction that we uh, have seen to Umar ibn Al Khattab radiallahu an. And you know, uh, in the books of uh, Shuruh, there's very few uh, commentaries to Al Adab Al Mufrad. But under the title of Umar, because they have the Rawi or the Ruat, the narrators in a hadith, that has a little few lines to say about them. Under Umar, it said, there's no need to say anything about Umar. That's what it says in the book of commentary. And we've seen so far that we've mentioned every single companion so far, but for Umar, this is, at one time you feel happy to hear such a nice statement, and then you feel sad, right, where am I going to get the information from? So this is what I was facing when I saw that. But actually, the reason is, is because there's not a single Muslim, I don't believe, today, who does not know about Umar, who does not love Umar, who for Umar is not a hero. And actually, you know, uh, to try and work out his maqam, you know, we've already gone into detail with Ali ibn Abi Talib and we've seen what a magnificent person he was. And if you wanted a conclusion, a one-line summary, because to try and reduce everything, how is it possible to talk about Umar bin Khattab that you make CD sets of and write volumes on? How can you bring him down into one session? It's impossible. So if you want to make one sentence, then you heard about Ali ibn Abi Talib, so he was better than Ali ibn Abi Talib. Khalas. That's enough of a conclusion. And we've seen his maqam. He was second only to, uh, to, uh, to Abu Bakr, who we have not covered. But once you see who Abu Bakr is, and then you realize that he was second to him, Umar was, then you recognize who Umar was. But we should try and find out some extra information. Why? Because actually we need the barakah of his dhikr. To make dhikr okay, of his seerah is barakah for us. To remind ourselves of his life story, as Ibn Abbas said, if you want to remember, if you want to uh, remind yourself of justice, then make dhikr of Umar. If you want to uh, remind yourself of Umar and his system and his life and his characteristics, then make dhikr of his seerah and you'll be remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yani Ibn Abbas is trying to say that one of the forms of dhikrullah, make remembrance of Allah, is to make dhikr of the life story of Umar bin Khattab. That's how perfect it is as a story from beginning to end. It's Mubarak for us. And people like us, we need as much barakah as we can in these times. And why not? Yani, why not wouldn't such a person be uh, at this state, at this kind of station when the Prophet ﷺ said that if there was going to be a Prophet after me, Umar ibn Khattab. it would have been Umar ibn al-Khattab if there was going to be a Prophet. That's an ajeeb statement, especially when you see Islam and all its rulings and its belief system and how it's protected and the statements of the Prophet ﷺ warning the Jews and the Christians and the Muslims to not take people as, as, as deities and so on and so on. And it's, we have such a sadd al and yani this blocking and closing the door to all this possible kind of uh, uh, hero worship, right? And yet here we have what is as close as possible a statement as you can to promoting hero worship of Umar. If there was going to be a prophet, and there isn't, but if there was going to be a prophet after me, it would have been Umar ibn al-Khattab. And that's why in some other narrations of the Prophet they used to say that there were some people who used to be uh, yani people who had received this, this, uh, this ilham, okay? This kind of uh, divine wisdom, not just yani firasa, this intuition that certain believers and awliya have, but he had, he had this firasa, this intuition, this wisdom, but something extra, something extra, but not enough to make him a prophet. He, we're dealing with, something, with someone extra special. And that's what you have to try and understand before we start. And who actually is Umar ibn Khattab when it comes to his life story? When you want to try and uh, make a summary of who he was, he was a man who lived and died by Kitabullah. He stood for it and he died for it and he defended it to the hilt. And he was what we will call Al-Mujahidu Fi Sabilillah. If you want to see the definition of the Mujahid, fi sabillah, look at Umar ibn Khattab. He was the one, as the Salaf used to say, who would wake late at night, who would wake up late at night to pray to allow the people to sleep. He would be the one who would go hungry so that the people could eat. This is his system, his approach to life. Uh, Ibn Abbas said, uh, Muawiyah radiallahu anhu said, he said that Abu Bakr, 
He never wanted the dunya and the dunya never wanted him. As for Umar ibn Khattab, the dunya wanted him, but he left the dunya. He did not want it. His actions and everything that we see about him, his, his demeanor and his approach to life, as, as, as we mentioned previously before, as if he didn't have a care for the dunya. For him, it was not really important what happens. It was the goal, the maqsad that he was trying to establish. And what's so amazing about this, as we'll see from some of the, the quotes of the companions, is that where did all this come from? Was he the first of the Muslims? No. Was he from the kibar, oldest, oldest? No. Was he the first to make hijrah? No. Was he in any extra way related to the Prophet ﷺ? No. If you look at his life story, he was from the Quraysh, one of the noble people of Quraysh, one of their respected members. And, and, the, uh, and actually, the story of Umar becoming Muslim is a science in itself, right? There's so many different uh, stories. You'll find them in children's books, and you'll find them very famously narrated amongst the Muslims, okay? And at the, it's interesting to know that the majority of these, um, these narrations are actually weak, uh, uh, specifically made weak by, by uh, Imam here, Imam al-Bukhari. But they're not of uh, an absolute weakness to totally discount. And we can glean some useful information. And I think the most, the most uh, common one that is known is the one which is narrated in, is in its most complete sense, because there's many different variations and so on. Uh, as I said, the weak, uh, a weak narration in its most complete sense is that narrated by Imam al-Bayhaqi in Al-Dala'il, one of his books, uh, one of his very famous books, and that was that he was on his way to actually kill the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why? Because he had been, uh, propaganda had come and spread in, in, uh, in Mecca, and the Quraysh and the Quraysh leaders were asking you know, people to find him and I'll give them so many thousand dirhams whoever can find and get rid of this evil for us and so on. And in one narration, Abdul Khattab said, are you, are you serious? You're going to give 1,000 dirhams for the one who kills Muhammad? Really? And they said, yeah, wallahi, that's the absolute truth. And in that narration, he had uh, a dream. And in his dream, this, uh, he, he saw himself going to do that, but then he saw himself being prevented. There's so many different narrations about how he actually set off on this journey to try and, and, and find the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to kill him. And in this narration of Bayhaqi, he was going and he came across a companion by the name of Nu'aym ibn Abdullah, who had just become Muslim recently. And he said, Ya Umar, where are you going? He said to him, I'm going to find uh, this man Muhammad and his people and so on. You know what they've done? They've, they've cursed our gods and they've ruined the Quraysh and they've split us up and we are now, and there's no more unity and, and so on and so on. They deserve to be, and, and you know, very angry. And, and Nu'aym said to him, he said to him that, you're, you're talking about uh, Muhammad and I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Why don't you start at home? Why don't you start with your brother-in-law? Why don't you look to your sister? And he's like, what? My sister? My brother-in-law? And they said, yeah, why don't you go and go, go to the house and see what's happening? So he was shocked and angry. And he went rushing to the house of his sister. And as he was approaching his house, inside was Fatima bin uh, uh, um, uh, Khattab, the, the, the sister of, the, of Umar bin Khattab, and Saeed ibn Zayd, the brother of, uh, the brother-in-law of Umar bin Khattab, and uh, Khubab ibn al-Arat, yani the, one of the major companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who was teaching them Quran, teaching them Quran. And as you know, in this narration, it was Surah At-Taha, from a, a piece of paper. And as he was coming up to the house and he heard the recitation, and he said as he was walking up, he said, what is this? Uh, and it, it wasn't in a praiseworthy sense. He goes, what is this jumbo? Okay, I, I can't understand it. it. It being recited doesn't make any sense. And what is it? They heard him coming. Khubab runs and hides. He knows this is trouble. He comes in and, you know, mayhem then ensues. He beats Saeed ibn Zayd, attacking him. The, his, uh, his sister tries to get in the way and so on. He hits the, the sister. She falls, bleeds. He looks at her, feels obviously remorseful, what have I done here? And then obviously now out of his anger to some kind of sanity, he you know, calms down and then he says, what is it? That and then, uh, you know, actually what I forgot to say is that the page that they were reading from was being hidden underneath Fatima. So it came out and fell down and so he picked up, what is this? And uh, let me read it. And Fatima, even in this state, even in this state, because she became very upset and very angry. Yes, we have become Muslim. Yes, we have uh, followed uh, the, the deen of Allah and his messenger. You know, in defiance, now that it's out, it's out. Uh, but you are not going to read this unless you purify yourself, unless you make ghusl. So Imam Khattab then made ghusl. He didn't know what he was making ghusl for, but he said, okay, khalas, let's purify ourselves, let's read it. And he started to read. And he was shocked by what he read in this narration. Okay? And then what happened is that uh, Khubab then came out. He realized that, hold on, this isn't 
as bad a situation as I thought. And so he came out and he took the opportunity in this narration. He said, Ya Umar, come on, uh, you know that you're right for this. And you know this is good for you. All right? And I'm telling you now, I'm going to tell you something that yesterday I heard the Prophet ﷺ make a dua asking Allah to strengthen this deen with you. So why don't you go and, and, uh, and, and accept Islam? So Umar said, Khalas, show me this Muhammad and I'm going to go and accept Islam. That's, the, that's what he said in this narration. And then, we, uh, the, the, as, as, as it goes, as it famously goes, he then went to the, the house near Safa where the Prophet ﷺ was staying with his companions. And there's Abu Bakr there and Hamza was there and so on and a few other people. And they heard, and, and as he was walking, he was twirling his sword, you know, like, like he does, you know, big man, strong man. And he was walking very confidently and so on. And they saw him coming in the door. And Faza, yani they were shocked and scared. And, oh my goodness, it's Umar bin Khattab coming. What we're going to do? What we're going to do? And here he's coming, walking down, and, uh, and he comes up to the door and knocks on the door and so on. And then Hamza says a very famous statement. He says, uh, let him in. If he's come for, for khayran, then we will be then uh, the best that uh, one can possibly be with the guest. But if he comes for sharran, if he comes for any evil or any fitna or wants to mess around, then we'll kill him with his own sword. We'll kill him with this is Hamza. Don't, yeah, this is no, we're not talking about some little Hamza, all right? Ibn Abdul Muttalib, the uncle of the Prophet said, so this sword that he's, yeah, we'll kill him with that sword. Don't worry, let him in. The Prophet said, yeah, let him in, let him come in. No one knew what was going to happen. Very interesting, in this narration. And then the Prophet said that, Ya, ya Umar, what brings you here and so on? And uh, he then says that I've come to, to accept and, uh, and follow the deen of Allah and his messenger. And the Prophet said, Takbir, big loud Takbir. And the people of the house, Ahlul Bayt, who were there, they also you know, became very happy and they knew that Umar bin Khattab. Why were they happy? Why were they happy? Because of the dua which is narrated by Imam Bukhari. Allahumma izz al-Islam bi ahabbu hadayn rajulayn ilayk. Yani Abi Jahl ibn Hisham aw Umar bin Khattab. And as the Rawi said, wa kan ahabbuhuma ilayhi, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Umar bin Khattab. He said that in front of this majlis, the Prophet ﷺ said, Oh Allah, strengthen and honor this religion with, uh, with one of these two men, the most beloved of one of these two men here. And who? Yani Abu Jahl, okay, the leader of the Quraysh, and, uh, and Umar bin Khattab, one of them. And as the Rawi said, that and the, the most beloved to Allah from these two was Umar bin Khattab. So there's, here is where the legacy, the legacy starts. And we have this, this uh, the development now of Umar as, as, as one of the leaders of Islam. Abu Hafsa, as the Prophet ﷺ called him. He gave him this kunya of Abu Hafsa after Hafsa, who was the eldest child of, the Prophet, of, of Umar bin Khattab, who of course married the Prophet ﷺ as one of his uh, beloved wives. Al-Faruq was a name that was given to him, as you all know, Umar bin Khattab Al-Faruq. Why? He was the one who made it clear what was the haqq and what was the bat, and he was the one who defined what was good and what was bad. He was the one who, the, the oppressors, the oppressors in Rome, the criminals in Persia, the criminal Zionists in the Jazirat al-Arab in the Arabian Peninsula. He dealt with all of these people, all the criminals who were trying and, and enjoying their criminality and oppression and transgression. They had seen their last day because Abu Khattab, when he had come and entered Islam, as Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, yani we have not, he said, we have not stopped being strong and mighty and honored the day that Abu Khattab accepted Islam. Yani it was a turning point because then, as you, you, as you see from him now, his little development in Mecca, now he would have to move because the Prophet ﷺ was now moving to Medina and the establishment of Islam was now about to get into process. And the, the Hijrah was a very difficult thing to do for many, many of the Muslims. Many Muslims find it very, very difficult and they hid their Islam. But Umar bin, as we saw with, with Hamza in the famous narration, with Umar bin Khattab, likewise, it, was, it wasn't an issue. He stood, he went out, he, they said that he dressed up in his, best dre in his best dress. And you have to understand the political situation. The Quraysh are trying their very best, best, threatening any single person who wants to try and go to Medina. Because it's uh, demining the state, right? It's demining the authority of the Quraysh. It's uh, an insult, uh, an affront to their religion to go against the one that they're openly saying, this is their enemy and so on. And you're saying that now I'm supporting him and we're taking this and we're taking our people. So they weren't allowing that. They were torturing people, killing people. People. As you know, the fitna in the time in Mecca was very difficult. But Umar al-Khattab, they said that he dressed up, perfumed himself, 
He got his sword, put it in the scabbard. He went out into the marketplace. He stood up. He pulled his sword out, did a few moves like that. He said, right, I'm going to, I'm going to, to Medina. I'm on the hijrah. Who wants, to, who wants his mother to lose their son? Who wants to make yani, orphans? Who wants to make orphans? Anyone, then come and stop me. This was the way that yani, he came out. This was his way. That's why in the dua, يعني, أرحم بأمتي أبو بكر وأشد في أمر الله عمر As the Prophet ﷺ used to make dua, that the most merciful in this religion uh, with, with the people is Abu Bakr. And the most يعني, أشد, the most strict and the most hardcore when it comes to the deen of Allah and its system is Umar bin Khattab. He was that kind of person. That was his tabi'ah. That was his character. He was strong. He was fearless. He didn't have He did not fear anyone. He did not fear the blame of the blamers. There's one thing about being scared of someone who is attacking you. What about those who are, example, just blaming you for things, saying things about you? He didn't care about criticism of these people. It was not important. For him, Dean totally enveloped him. And that is why he became such a figure in Islam. And more importantly than that, such a figure for the Muslims at that time. What's the importance of, the, uh, what, does that, what do I mean by that? If I say someone is good, or he was a big scholar, then who am I really to say that, right? Only real scholars or people of a high level can really say about another person that they are of a certain quality or of a certain level, right? That's, you know, the, the people of the same level will be able to make tazkiyah. So when people at the bottom say he's a great scholar, I wouldn't know what a scholar is in the first place without being able to say he's a great scholar. But when these scholars themselves, the leaders of the companions itself, they, they used to say that he is the best, he is the most knowledgeable, then you realize you're dealing with a different kind of character. And so then we see his hijrah with the, to, to, to Medina and his establishment with the Prophet ﷺ as his right-hand man after Abu Bakr radiallahu an. And his status has been confirmed by the Prophet Sallallahu in so many different beautiful ahadith that when you, you know, you can just keep when you talk, when you look at Umar Khattab, you can divide it into sections his characteristics, his statements, they're just pearls of wisdom everything that he said before he took leadership and then everything that he said after he took leadership in terms of the laws and the lessons to be made because he was ruling and he and as you know he entered uh, Palestine and he dealt with the Christians and dealt with the Jews, he dealt with enemies who attacked him, he dealt with the political issues and establishment of, polit uh, of, of policies and social issues and so on. Everything there is, you can, then you have another category, what the Prophet ﷺ said about Umar, just a category by itself. And you find a hadith in the thousands. The Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith, I was, I was in paradise, I saw myself in paradise and I saw a, a, a huge gold palace. And I thought this must be for me. So I said, who is this for? This is for Umar bin Khattab. This is for Umar bin Khattab. So, يعني, you know, and the Prophet Sallallahu said that the Ahlul, the Ahlul Darajat, the people of high status, the people of high status will look, will, will look beneath the, them, okay, to the others, like, the, like as you now look at the stars in the sky, okay, in the far horizon. And know that Abu Bakr and Umar are from them. And, 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 they, and they are from the very best of them as well. The Prophet Sallallahu said that to Ali radiallahu anh, he said you should know that you know Abu Bakr and Umar, they are, they are the Sayyidan, they are the two, the, the two masters of Al-Awwalin wal akhirin of the first and the last in paradise, except for the Prophets and the Messengers. Don't tell them. Don't tell them, he said to Ali, don't let them know. And yeah, the Prophet in his, in, his, uh, in his hadith about establishing Umar as, uh, as, uh, as uh, uh, how important he was and uh, his maqam, it cannot, be, it cannot be compared. Look at, the, for example, the hadith of how many times has Umar bin Khattab been promised paradise? In, uh, 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 straightly, he would say Umar bin Khattab fil jannah. Just a straight statement like that. In another narration, he was with some companions and he said that here comes a man and he's from paradise. And the door would open and in would walk Umar. And then you know the hadith of the Ashar al Mubashara, the ten promised paradise. The Prophet said, Abu Bakr fil Jannah, wa Umar fil Jannah, wa Uthman fil Jannah, wa Ali fil Jannah, wa Talha fil Jannah, wa Zubair fil Jannah, wa Abdul Rahman ibn Awf fil Jannah, wa Saad ibn Maqaz fil Jannah, wa Sa'id ibn Zayd fil Jannah, wa Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah fil Jannah. The ten, the blessed, the superstars of this ummah. And the only, yani, uh, only after Abu Bakr can we find Umar ibn Khattab. His, his position, his maqam, 
Look at his different characteristics. Look at his, look at his different titles. They said, to, they, said, they said he is the one that the Quran agreed with. They used to, the scholars used to uh, differ amongst themselves of how what is the best way to say this. Because it sounds like a dodgy statement, right? To say that, you know, that Umar bin Khattab agreed with the Quran. You might think, hold on, the Quran is the haqq, and so if someone agrees with it, we must all agree with it. Okay, let's try it the other way around. Then the Quran agrees with Umar bin Khattab. That sounds a bit dodgy, right? Because how can the Quran come and agree with the statement of a man? But that is how the scholars... You know, they knew it was quite simple. It was that Umar ibn Khattab said something and the Quran came down to affirm it. For example, the issue of the Maqam of Ibrahim. The Prophet وسلم, uh, Umar ibn Khattab said, wouldn't it be nice that yani, we take this place of Ibrahim as a, uh, as a place of prayer? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as when Bukhari narrates and as we studied before, re revealed the ayah, min Ibrahim musalla, and take the station of Ibrahim as a, a place of prayer. It was revealed. And then in the other place where the Prophet said, where, where Umar ibn Khattab said, Ya Rasulullah, all these people are coming into your house now. Okay, all these evil people, fasic people, dodgy people, they're coming in. Wouldn't it be good yani, that we ensure that the women in the house, your wives are, are covered and so on? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ayah, Ya Ayyuhan Nabi, Qul li azwajika wa banatika wa nisa'il mu'mineen. Say to, O oh, 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 Prophet of Allah, Say to your wives and your daughters and the Nisa al Mu'mineen and you deneen, then they to Alay Hinnam in Jalabib, Hinna Dalika Adana. Okay, that, that they should get from their Jalabib, their outer garments, and cover themselves with, uh, cover themselves with it. That is going to be easier for them. And you are Rafna, Fala you Udain. That it will be, they will become known as such and that they will not become molested. Wakan Allah, Hurafur al Rahima. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is off forgiving, most merciful. This is after he suggested. And then, the, when he found another occasion, when he found out that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that the, the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that he was angry with them because of some of their actions. So he went to them and he said to them, as you know, he said, yeah, uh, what are you doing? Don't you think that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will replace you with people better than you? Yani, well, who do you think you are? This is the Messenger of Allah. And then, you know, they got angry and they said to Umar, who do you think you are? Don't you think that the Messenger of Allah can tell us better than you? What, who are you trying to be? So then Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala then uh, reveals the ayah. That maybe that the Lord will come and he will, uh, that he will uh, make you divorce from them and replace you with better. Replace you with better. And this is not just the only case. What about Badr? Where the Prophet ﷺ was not sure what to do about the, the captives that they had taken from the Quraysh who had been killing all the Muslims, whether to, to ransom them back to, to the Quraysh or to have them to be, to be killed. And Abu Bakr, as you know, they wanted them to be uh, uh, ransomed and so on. Abu Khattab said, Abadan, not what they've done for their crimes, they must accept capital punishment. Absolutely. And, Abu, and, and the Prophet ﷺ went with, you know, he made his decision on to ransom them. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals the ayah to prove that Abu al Khattab actually was more correct, that they should not have been ransomed. And then, for example, the prayer of, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam over uh, of, uh, of, of, of Ubay, Abdullah ibn Ubay al-Salul, the leader of the Munafiqeen, when he had died. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prayed the janazah over him, wanted to pray janazah over him, Abu Khattab held him. You went to pray over him, the leader of the Munafiqeen, the Ra'as of the Kuffar, the head of the disbelievers, the leader of the hypocrites, you're going to pray over him. And the Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala reveals the ayah, making it impermissible to pray for the Munafiqeen and for the Kuffar. This is, yani, you know, do you, you know, do you see now why when he says, لَوْ كَانَ مِنْ بَعْدِ نَبِيٌّ لَكَانَ عُمَرْ بْنَ الْخَطَّابِ If there was going to be a prophet after me, it would have been Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an. And, you know, where do we stop? How far do we go? His narrations, he likes to keep going and going. His actions and his statements and the, the statements of the companions about him and his aura and his justice. As I said to you about his justice, you know, his... His love for justice made him absolutely devoted to jihad, to, to jihad itself. And you know what he said? The, 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 the Prophet Sallallahu said when he, he was put on new, uh, Abu Huraira narrates in his hadith that he put on uh, 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 like a new, a new uh, that kind of robe. And the Prophet Sallallahu saw him and he said, is this a is this jadid or a ghasil? Is this new or has it just been washed? And, uh, and, and he said, it's, uh, it's new. So he said to him this famous dua, ilbas jadid wa ish hamid wa mut shaheed. Yani wear it anew and live a good, happy life, praiseworthy life, and die as a martyr. And this martyrdom was always on his mind. The Prophet ﷺ was on top of Uhud, the Mount of Uhud. And they said that Uhud was, was kind of uh, like shaking. 
يعني like a little bit of tremor. And he said, be still, ya Uhud. On top of you now is a, uh, and, and who was with him? What Abu Bakr and Umar and Ali, and they were on top of him, and he said, and he said be, be still, ya Uhud. On top of you now is a prophet and a Siddiq and two martyrs. I'm referring to Uthman and Ibn Khattab and Siddiq Abu Bakr, of course. And why, why can you see this ilaqa, this, this, this uh, connection, clear connection between Umar ibn Khattab and Shahada? Why? Because of his love for justice. Because what is jihad but to establish justice? And we see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he never left the side of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Badr, and in Uhud, and in Al-Khandaq, in Al-Fatih, and the Bayar Ridwan, and in Hunayn, all the battles, and in so many more after the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Where does one go? Where the, look at the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. This is, as I said before, the best way to understand the maqam of a person, the best way to understand and appreciate someone is to look to see what his peers say about him. When they said that, you know, if someone says about you, the best of people says that yani, his Islam for us was a fatah, it was an opening for us. And his hijrah for us was a nasr, it was a victory for us, it was an aid for us. And his, his, uh, his wilaya was adlan lana, and his leadership itself, his taking over was an establishment of justice, a mercy in itself for us. This is the, the companions themselves speaking, Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an. He said, about, uh, he said about Umar ibn Khattab, he said, A'alamuna billah, he was the most knowledgeable. Um, and who is Ibn Mas'ud, by the way? We've covered Ibn Mas'ud, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, one of the four Abdullahs, okay? In the, the, the early chapters of, uh, of Al-Adab al-Mufrad. Not a small figure, the faqih of the, of the Sahaba, one of the major scholars of the Sahaba. What they, he is saying, the most knowledgeable of us in terms of Allah, وَأَقْرَأُنَا فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ The most uh, uh, versed in reciting the book of Allah, the most versed in reciting the book of Allah and the most yani, azhad fi dunya the most yani, ascetic yani, not, doesn't care a little bit about the dunya it's not just like me and you just making up claims and talking about making up claims this is a really good, a great one Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said you know if you take the ilm of, of Umar and you put it into a scale and you put the ilm of every single other person on the face of this earth he said ahya al-ard Okay, in the Mizan, it will not outweigh the ilm of Umar. Now, listen to this. Amash, one of the great tabi'een, hearing this statement, took it to one of the great kibar tabi'een, Ibrahim Nakhai, one of the imams and one of the teachers of, of, uh, of Abu Hanifa. Uh, and you know what he said to him? He said that, you know, he made inkar of this statement. He goes, come on, this is now, you, look, he's a great man, but you're getting a bit carried away here now, right? And this is a bit of exaggeration. And Ibrahim al he said, he said, uh, and exactly what do you have a problem with in this statement? For wallahi, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud told me something even greater than that, with an authentic sanad. He said that the, I believe that ilm is divided into ten parts and nine-tenths of it passed away the day that Umar ibn Khattab died. And you're telling me about yani, uh, weighing and this, that, whatever, and I'm telling you this? Uh, you know, it's a, and it's a beautiful statement when you see the major kibar muhaddithin discussing amongst themselves and trying to make tahqiq of things which do not seem possible. Because everyone has a, a frame of reference and trying to understand and appreciate what can be true, what can't be true. And you're put in your place like that. And you can see the, the, you know, the, 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 the respect that the companions, you see, you earn respect. You can't buy respect and force respect. And Abu al Khattab was seen as a hero, not just by the Muslims, not just by his companions, not just by uh, you know, the people around him, but the people who hear about him from the non-Muslims and non-Muslim kings and so on, they'd respect him so much. They couldn't believe that this was the Amir Mu'mineen and how much respect and love that he commanded by, by his companions for him. And you know, when he used to speak, Talha ibn Shihab, he said that, you know, we used to, kunna, kunna we used to, we used to discuss amongst ourselves. The way that this statement, kunna nahadith, yani means that when we're sitting down, just chilling out and just chatting amongst ourselves, we used to think, you know, Amr ibn Khattab, when he used to speak, actually it was an angel speaking for him. Because we can't understand that these kind of statements can come from a man. That, ala lisanihi malak, yani, that upon his tongue is actually an angel saying all these statements. It, otherwise, it can't be possible. And they have a haiba for him. You know, they had this, they, they, they had this awe because of his presence. He had an aura. He had this kind of, you know, like a, a buzz around him that they couldn't uh, overcome. And that's, he, he earned that, and not just through how strong and strict he was. And there's no doubt about that. The Prophet ﷺ told him that, you know, that shaitan, when he sees you along the path, 
He takes the other path. He takes the other path. He just doesn't want to cross your path. And Umar ibn Khattab is saying, okay, that, you know, I mean, you know, what have I done to, to, to deserve that? And he's always yeah, and he's shocked about why are people talking about, why are they saying, I'm just a miskeen. I'm just saying, always putting himself down, always putting himself down. But as we know, the one who puts himself down is the one who yeah, and he rises amongst the eyes of the people. The one who recognizes that he is low, he really is the good one and the high one and the best of them. And the one who, he became the leader with unanimity and when they, when they saw what he gave them and what, what his position was, it was so clear he was born to be a leader, yet he disliked leadership, yet he would not allow people to take yeah, and this kind of position without understanding the responsibilities of knowledge and leadership. That's why he said, yeah, the, 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 uh, learn before you become a leader. Learn before you become a person who is uh, put into responsibility. And there's some great fiqh in this statement. You want to talk about the fiqh of Umar. His statements themselves are just huge and deep because once you become a leader, then responsibilities don't allow you to go back and learn and study. He said that, some of the ulama in explaining the, the wisdom behind it said that when you start to learn, uh, sorry, when you start to lead, then that person, for example, if you become a qadi, this is so true, subhanAllah. You want to talk about social anthropology of Muslims? This is so true. If you become a, 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 you know, a big figure in society, you become a qadi, you become a mufti, all right? for the government or become the chief or whatever, whatnot. Can you imagine that person then go back and then sit back in his place that he used to be in the circle under his normal teacher where they would normally, you know, discuss and learn whatever? No, that's it. Once you become and tasted that, then how can you, the big leader, you know, go back and sit and so on and study like you used to do just a couple of days back? How can you go and, and, and of course, how can you implement and advise other people to do what you yourself have not fully understood? This is a point in, in our Islam and our fiqh where everyone wants to speak, everyone wants to talk, everyone wants to say and do, and we know this, we know that. You know, Ibn Umar said about him in terms of learning Quran, and learning Quran is something that we do, and uh, for example, myself, I've done Surah Al-Baqarah with our teacher, and we took it in semi kind of detail. It took us something like three odd years to cover. And our group of people, I don't think any one of them, maybe one or two, actually memorized it or learned it or, or remember what, what we actually did in them three years. Okay? A few other people might give a bit more. Other people, they learn the Quran as if it's like some kind of exam textbook, right? Bang, 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 and just learn something and then I say, don't know anything about it, so on. Ibn Umar said that, um, that Abu Khattab learned Surah Al-Baqarah in 12 years. And after 12 years, once he had learned Surah Al-Baqarah, he sacrificed the camel big party, because he knew that yani, how much he had taken, how, what he had achieved from this action of learning Surah Al-Baqarah. So when we yani, read, you hear someone, I've learned Surah Al-Baqarah, or I know Tafsir Al-Quran, you know, I've read that study the Tafsir Al-Quran, it does really, you know, you, you, you just need to bring yourself back into reality, you know, let's just put, bring ourselves back down here. What do you exactly mean by, I know the Quran, or I learned the Quran, and, and, and so on, and so on. And actually it's very difficult. I won't, I won't try and pretend that it's easy to talk about Umar. Actually, it's not easy to talk about, uh, it's not easy to, 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 to condense quality. You can't condense quality. How can you condense something which is not meant to be condensed? How can you try to push it down? What do you decide to leave out? And what do you decide to include? And so on and so on. His companions are, are, are around him, they used to have so much respect of him. Ibn Abbas عن, said about him, uh, said in a narration, there was one thing I wanted to ask Umar. And I spent a whole year, Makathabihi Senate, and I stayed with him for an entire year, and I could not sum up the courage to ask him. And then I thought, this is now getting a bit, you know, this is getting crazy. So he went on Hajj, so I went on Hajj with him. And then after, you know, I found him on a path, and for I got a moment, I went up to him, and I summoned up my courage, and I said to him, right, I'd like to ask you, and this is narrated by Imam Bukhari in, in, his, uh, in the chapter of Tafsir. And I wanted to ask him, who was it that, that angered the Prophet ﷺ uh, so much in the Qur'an out of his wives? And Umar al Khattab told him, it was Aisha and Hafsa. And you know, and, and Abu Abbas said to him, you know something? I've waited a whole year to ask this question. I just couldn't get myself around it. I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. Umar al Khattab got very angry. He said, SubhanAllah, what are you talking about? Just ask. And if I know, I will tell you. And if I don't know, then, then, you know, then I'm you know, sorry about that. But this was what the people around him, he had this haiba, he had this aura. They used to say that a man, uh, uh, that a man would come to ask him for his need, come, see him, totally forget the need, go back home, 
got to realize, what did I go out for in the first place? All right, well, we'll forget that because I'm, that, that's not happening. And that was his system. Yet he himself always tried to make himself you know, down. He would walk amongst the, the, the markets and he would walk out in clothes and people wouldn't realize it was him and asking about the people, asking about the neighbors and hiding his face and asking so that people wouldn't be, you know, he was aware that they wouldn't be scared of him, they wouldn't be whatever so that they can be honest with him. You know, are you being treated right? Are you getting your food? Are you getting your money? And so on and so on. So they could give him a, a real kind of answer as opposed to... But, it, it, you know, when someone has that natural position, what can you do? In a, in a classic narration, his, the, the hajjam. Hajjam is the one who does cupping, right? Okay? Uh, you know what cupping is when you take the, the blood from the, 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 the bad blood effectively from the skin using a process of, of making little marks and then sucking up the, 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 the congealed blood. What he, what he did is that uh, uh, he was there in this kind of place. You can, you, you can, you, I suppose you could give it the example of modern day barber shop, right? And the barber shaving someone, all right? Of course, I was a billah, then imagine trying to shave Umar Khattab. So, you know, he was giving him hijama, right? And he's had these cups on him, and suddenly, Umar Khattab, he coughed. طيب? So he coughed, and the thing went a bit wrong, and a little bit of a cut, a little bit. And Umar Khattab didn't make anything. But this, this, uh, this hijam, he absolutely, he got so terrified as the Rawi says, narrated yani in the, by, by Imam Zahabi, he wet himself. <laughs> so, he, so he wet himself, can you imagine? I mean, you know, you put yourself in that position and you've just cut uh, Amir al-Mu'minin over al-Khattab. And yani, Amir al-Khattab realized that what had happened. You know, he didn't even thought about that, but then they, they said, and he realized that, hold on, something's going wrong here, and he looked and he guys wet himself. So he then said, I have to now give this guy 40 dirham. I, yani, as like a kind of a compensation from me. He put the compensation upon himself. There's no compensation for making someone wet themselves then because they're scared of you. But he did that because he, you know, this is Umar. You know, his whole life full of just beautiful anecdotes and stories and, and, and you know, it's, it's, it, you, you'll swim in his seerah. Really, you will. And when, that's the same with all the mountains of Islam. Actually, the Muslims today are so lucky. Just yeah, I need for us to be able to read about our alam, about our nubala, about our great people, our noble people. It is an honor for us. It's an izzah for the Muslims today to be connected to Umar al-Khattab with that which he said. That we, kunna, uh, we, was, we used to be a dhileen, we used to be yani, humiliated people. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then ennobled us with Islam. Okay, and that's what yani, we have become. Who are we except yani, for our Islam? What are we except for our deen? And this is what Umar al-Khattab spent his entire life to, to show and, and, and prove and establish. And his amal, his action, something that we see and we just marvel at. And of course, every, um, every beautiful story has to, of course, come to an end. And his life story, you know, uh, indeed has an end. And when it comes to, as we said, shahada, he made a, a dua in, and it's narrated in the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari as well. Where he said, Ya Allah, Rizakni Bishahada fi sabilik, yani give me the shahada in your way, give me martyrdom in your path, but make me die in the ballad of Rasulik, yani. make me die, make me die in the land of your messenger. And what happened? What happened is as you as you probably uh, will uh, be aware of in his uh, final days, he was becoming old and, and, and weak anyway, and he was leading the salah, Salatul Fajr in the masjid. And as the uh, Abdurrahman ibn Awf the Rawi says, he went forward to, to uh, lead the Salah and he went and checked the, the rows as the, as the Salaf and the Sahaba used to do. Go through the rows, check them, straighten them, make sure all the gaps are closed. Okay? And he said, Isto. that's what they said, we heard Isto. And then he started and he started reciting Surah Yusuf or Surah Nahl. He wasn't sure. And, and there's a real reason why he wasn't sure. The events that were to follow were of an incredible nature. So he started reciting Surah Yusuf and Nahl, and the reason, of course, is because, as the Rawi said, so that the, the more people would be able, you know, to, a long surah, so that more people can make it to the masjid. That's the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in those kind of prayers to allow people to come and get there, okay, to start the first rak'ah longer than the second. And so he started, and uh, during the recitation, they heard a takbir, Allahu Akbar, qatalani. I, 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 they heard the takbir, he said, he has killed me. And in another narration, he has eaten me, al-kalb, akalani, the dog has eaten me. And the first, the first, the first role, the uh, Abd al-Rahman, he narrates, he said that we saw this, yani, uh, this uh, a person from Ajam, uh, this uh, criminal from Ajam, he had stabbed Umar bin Khattab, and then he went and, uh, into a frenzy. Because after stabbing him, the companions, they, they, they firmed, yani they, they, they strengthened their line to not allow him to mistake, to, 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 to escape. 
and as they and as he tried to escape, they couldn't go. He couldn't go left. He couldn't go right. So he started slashing out, and in his slashing out, he attacked 15 people. Seven died, just at that time. Not a single person broke this. Look at the salah. If you remember at the, at the beginning of this book, how many sessions ago about the importance of salah and how we consider what salah is and what they used to consider what salah was. And he killed seven people and until one of them then just jumped on him and as you realize that now he's not going to mistake, he cut his own throat and he, and he died. And, remember, and at the back they said, that the, the, the lions, they, they didn't know what was going on. At Raif al-Masjid, they didn't, and on the edges of the masjid, they didn't realize what was going on. All they realized is they couldn't hear the, the voice of Umar anymore. And Umar, in semi-conscious state, he, 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 he goes to the first line and he grabs Abdurrahman ibn Auf by the hand and he pulls him forward and, you know, to, to finish the prayer. To finish the prayer. I mean, just think about this. Just play these events out as if it was happening in front of you. And then, then Abdurrahman ibn Auf then pray, prayed a very quick uh, uh, to, to uh, the second rakah, and they, they finished, and he was there, and he bleeding, and, and semi-conscious, and then he became unconscious. They took him home, and then he was very ill for uh, uh, you know the, the, the next period of time, and then he came into consciousness and out of consciousness, and they tried to feed him, and they used to say, they said, narrated by Ibn Abbas and other of the kibar, they said that when they used to give him juice and milk, and he used to weep out of his wounds. That it, it literally started to pour from him. That's how badly he was cut up. And he was on his deathbed. There was no doubt about that. And the companions recognized that. And they said, Abdullah bin Mas'ud said, that the, 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 the huzn, the grief that hit Medina at that time had not been experienced since the time of the Prophet ﷺ. That their grief and the crying that afflicted the people was something which could not be any imagined. And everyone, and they used to say that everyone would go uh, meet each, uh, people in the street. They would, they would look at each other and they'd say, La bats, la bats, it's okay, no problem. This is the whole. And people, just, the strangers in the, in the street would meet each other and just say that to each other, just to console, console one another. And then he regained consciousness. And uh, Ibn Abbas narrates that he said, uh, did, they, did, they, did they pray? Did they pray? And he wasn't now with it. He asked now, uh, you know, about the salah which happened days earlier. Have they prayed? Did they, con did they, con did they finish the prayer? And they said, no, they prayed. He said that, yani, la Islam salah. There is no Islam for the one who leaves the prayer. There is no Islam for the one who leaves prayer. Yani, in his state, he just, he, when people are in this kind, when people are of a different level of priorities in their mind, when these people themselves, they don't see life like we see life and what's important, they, they're on a different level. For them, you know, the reality changes. He, in, in his, he asked for the water to be made wudu of, and he made wudu, and he prayed in his, in his, in his condition. And then he, he weakened considerably. And then, uh, then Abdullah ibn Umar was the, was the one who was then letting few people in. And one boy, and just look at the, the way of, of Umar, one boy comes in. And you know, people are crying. Can you imagine a situation like that? And this boy comes in and he says, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, abshir billah, that yani, have glad tidings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you glad tidings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is happy with you, as he says in the Quran. And be happy that you had the companionship of the Messenger of Allah. And be happy that you have done in Islam what you have done. And Abdul Khattab, he stayed silent. And then he walked off. He walked, he, he walked out of the room. Yani, you know, he's done his, he paid his respects. And the, the, as he's walking out, his, his like uh, thobe is dragging along, uh, amongst the, along the floor. And so he said to his companions, bring that uh, young boy back in this state. And the boy comes back and he says, lift your thobe because it is better for your thobe and it is yani, more pure for you, more taqwa for you with your, uh, with your Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In his death throes, he is seeing and trying to establish the deen of Allah. As the Prophet said. And then and he realized this was the last time for his wasiyah, for his last testament. And he gave the testament to the people and he advised them to fear Allah and to look after the poor and to respect and honor the Ansar and the Muhajireen and the early elders. And he uh, uh, commanded them to, to, to follow the leader who had been appointed by the, the Majlis. And then he grabbed, he, he, he grabbed the hand of Abdullah ibn Umar and asked him to hold him. And he had his head in his lap, in his hijr. And he said to him, put my, 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 my head on the floor. Rub it on the floor. And he said that, yani, oh Allah, have mercy upon this face. R rubbing it in the floor. Have mercy upon this face. And then he said to, to, to Abdullah ibn Umar, he said to him, he said to him, look at my debts and 
see what you can get from my estate and pay it. And what you can't get from my estate, then you try and pay it. And what you can't get yourself, then from my family. And what you can't get from my family, then from the Quraysh, from the tribe, to make sure that it is dealt with. And, and Abdullah bin Umar said, I will. And then he said, I will have one final thing. I want you to go to Aisha. And I want you to say to Aisha that, that, that Umar gives you salam. And don't say Amir Mu'mineen, because now I am not Amir Mu'mineen. And say to her, please give me permission to be laid next to the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then Abdullah ibn Umar went to Aisha. And he went in upon Aisha, and she was crying. She was crying. Because the whole city was crying, actually. It was a, a, a moment of disaster for the nation. And during her tears, he said to her, Assalamu alaikum, and Umar says, Assalamu alaikum, and she said, Wa alaikum alayhi salam. He said that I, I've come to seek permission for Umar to be placed next to his beloved. And Aisha started to cry more. And Abdullah ibn Umar said, why? What's wrong? And he, she said that this place I had reserved for myself. I had reserved this final place next to my husband and next to my father. But he is more deserving of this place than I am. And then he went back to Umar ibn Khattab and he knocked on the door. And he went in and Umar ibn Khattab said to the one who was next to him, who is this person who has come? Because he, now he couldn't tell anymore. And he said, it's your son, Abdullah ibn Umar. So then he walked in and he took him by the hand and he was in the last moments and he said to him, he said to him that I have good news for you, father. He said, what is that? He said, you will be buried next to the one that you love. And that يعني, is the end. He passed away, radiallahu an. And the grief and the huzn and the stress and the, the difficulty at that time had not been matched since the death of the Prophet Sallallahu And you know, it is something no doubt very, very depressing. But yani, you know, through this distress and the sadness that we see, you know, going back to the seer of our people and our alam and, and our great people, it's an emotional roller coaster. You will laugh and you will and be amazed and you will cry and you'll be amazed and you'll be you'll be ashamed because you look at them and you say, yani, well, look at them and look at us now and look at our lives and look at you know how they used to to, to live and it starts to put things into perspective. But that's good because you know we need that. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings people like this in our ummah so that we can see and reach out and touch them and feel them, relate to them and understand them and then follow them. The Prophet ﷺ said as his dying message, follow the two who will come after me, Abu Bakr wa Umar. Follow them, emulate them, copy them in everything. They are my religion. And this is why these people are arisen. These are why the people are produced for us in Islam, for us to reach out and to follow. And Umar ibn Khattab, is there anyone greater than that? And uh, we don't have any more time actually uh, to, to, to do the hadith, but at least we've seen a little glimpse, and I really, I mean it, a little glimpse into the life of Amr ibn Khattab, radiallahu anhu wa arda. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give him gentle firdaus and give him the highest maqam. Ameen, ya rabbil alameen. Wa subhanakallahum wa bihamdika shadu wa la ilaha illa antu astaghfiruka allahum wa atubu ilayk.